everyone. Welcome. So I want to say, tell you a little bit about him, but I need my glasses. Okay. Sundar Ramaswamy, he's an economist and educator, has published four books, scores of professional articles, and delivered over 175 invited lectures on four continents. Wow. He's been with Middlebury College since 1990, where he currently is a distinguished college professor of international economics and the director of the program in international and global studies. From 2009 to 2015, he was president of the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, California. That's a nice place. It is. <laughs> at Middlebury College, he has also served as chairman of the economics department, dean of faculty, and vice provost. He spent sabbaticals at the World Bank, Vanderbilt, Purdue, IFMR, and Madras School of Economics in India, including two stints as directors. So he's very accomplished. His teaching, scholarly, and administrative accomplishments have received, hold on, numerous awards. He has also, also has extensive board service and most recently was appointed Chairman Emeritus of the Asia Foundation, the largest US-based international NGO focused on Asia. He received his PhD in economics from Purdue, an MA from Delhi School of Economics, and a BA honors in economics from St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi, India. Please welcome Sunder. Can you all hear me? OK. Thank you, Carol. And um, thank you, Linda. I think she first contacted me maybe in February of this year. And you know, you commit to a date eight months later, and suddenly, Eight months pass by, and here we are. But I'm glad the day is beautiful. It is wonderful to drive up Route 7 and, uh, and enjoy this. Um, I've always enjoyed giving lectures, not just to my own peers and academics, but to different audiences. And I will say that both in um, similar places in Middlebury, but also when we were in California, um, it's, a, you know, it's a different audience I get when I talk to folks like you, because you, lived, you had a wonderful lived experience unlike my undergraduates who are really passionate, but they're 18 to 22 year olds. So it's always a nice mix to come in and give this uh, sort of a lecture. Um, so what I want to do today is um, walk you through a set of slides about this topic, Elephants Can Dance, India's Expanding Role in the Global Economy. Um, as, as Carol so kindly introduced, I'm an international and development economist. I, I spent more than half my life in, um, in the US, 34 of them in Vermont, and prior to that at grad school. Um, and, uh, but I, when I first was studying the subject in India, I did not want to touch India at all. So I actually learned French and did focused on Africa. And it's only the last 20 years that India has become, I think, an interesting economy. Um, and what I want to make a case today is why uh, people should pay attention uh, to this uh, to sort of, uh, continental civilizational power, uh, that's India, both for India's sake, for globe's sake, but also if you're in the US. Title, um, I love elephants, but that's not the only reason. Um, you know, China is always associated in, uh, in the text with dragons, and India is home to many gods, but one of them is also the elephant-headed god, uh, who is the remover of all obstacles, Ganesha. But also elephants, um, having been chased by an elephant uh, while on a safari, uh, elephants don't have acceleration like a cheetah or a leopard, but they have momentum, right? Uh, they, they can really maintain it. And so in some ways, the elephant is sort of like, a, it's an interesting metaphor for this lumbering giant of uh, what I would call the Indian economy. Uh, so, I'm going to give you a little bit of history and then bring you all the way to the present, right? So in some ways, uh, we all know this from various lectures and classes and programs you've watched about how we carved the world into 26-odd empires, and then now we are at about 200-odd countries. And of course, the, the prime, uh, the British Empire, which is the light blue teal, you can see the spread of it, right? You can see the expanse of the British Empire. Um, and the British landed in India in 1604. Uh, and uh, 
for them the crown jewel was this uh, land mass called India and they became, uh, it became a protectorate of the empire uh, uh, when Queen Victoria officially proclaims in 1858 and then of course finally they get independence in 1947. So the modern India story doesn't start till 1947 and what I want to say is not give you a 75, 80 year history but really focus on what's happening currently and why uh, people pay, are paying attention to this, uh, to this country. Uh, it's one of the ancient civilizations and this is the one thing I will say when you travel to Asia and I'm sure in Q&A I'd love to hear how many of you have traveled to this part of the world is there is a sense in at least China and India when you talk to whether it's academics, journalists, students, um, that these are not just countries. These have ancient civilizations and, um, and they do go back thousands of years, uh, the others being Egypt and Mesopotamia. But what's interesting with the Chinese story and the Indian story is that they are countries that matter in the modern global context. China, I mean Egypt not so much and neither is Iraq for different reasons, uh, but certainly there is a feeling uh, if you read the vernacular press, if you read the English dailies, uh, if you talk to academics, if you just talk to people on the street, um, there is a feeling that they're not just modern day countries, but they have a long history and uh, their time uh, is coming, right? And they feel like the last few hundred years when India became one of the poorest countries uh, after uh, colonialism was just an aberration, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a civilizational sense that oftentimes having been in this country for a very long time, we are a very, very young country. European deal with this, they also have a long history, but you certainly feel the odometer of history going back in time when you go to China and India, even more so than Europe. Of course, the word India itself comes from the Sanskrit name for the river Sindhu, uh, or the Indus River, which led to the first, one of the earliest civilizations, the Indus Valley Civilization. The old Persian equivalent of Sindhu was actually Hindus, and that's where the word Hindus come from, the religion, Hinduism, and the land of Hindustan, or the Stan is uh, place. So Hindu became the land of Hindustan, and it was actually coined by Persian Emperor Darius. India is also found in Herodotus, right? So it's interesting, this landmass uh, that I showed you is there in ancient Greece, and Herodotus, as you know, is credited with sort of the first historian, if you will, of the world. And by the time Alexander the Great, um, um, he of course fails. He wants to conquer India but doesn't and he succumbs when he's trying, uh, trying to expand his empire. But then it promotes this ancient trade routes and um, uh, goodwill gestures between the European civilizations for a long time and India. In Sanskrit, which is also one of the ancient languages and especially in this, the longest poem in the world which is called Mahabharata, which was composed somewhere around 4th century BC, out of which one of the most important chapters that you see everywhere called the Gita, um, the Bhagavad Gita, is, is embedded in the Mahabharata. It's also called Bharat. So in fact, what is now interesting is there is a, there's a, there's a, late, there's a move in India to basically rewrite uh, these names that have come from a long time and replace India with Bharat. Now, in a global modern context, you can't change the names of cities and countries like that. It takes a long time, uh, but that move is starting to happen, and there's a big debate in the Indian press. Should we do it? We identify with India. We are known as Indians. What is this Bharat? But of course, the, the government, which is behind this, also claims that there's a long lineage that goes back to 4th century BC for Bharat, so it's not the modern-day knee-jerk reaction, but that's also you'll start seeing it in the press about sometimes India being referred to as Bharat. So if you were to do a word cloud about things about India, right? Stereotypical, uh, what you hear in the press, what you watch in American TV shows, uh, you know, it helps that we have a, a person of half Indian origin running for one of the Democratic uh, presidential nominations. Um, so India is in the news for different reasons. But if I were to think of, think of the many words, and I've done this, uh, curating this list as I've talked to many students and many audiences, so if you have some things you want me to add to this list, please do, and then I'll credit the Triple E the next time I give a lecture on India. <laughs> but you know, you think of Bollywood, right? The, the famous uh, movie industry, many gods, cricket, the game that the British left behind, along with tea, too many people, cows, 
Ayurveda, which is the uh, Eastern holistic medicine practice, which of course you see in Vermont in many, in many places, in California too we saw it. Uh, Taj Mahal, maybe one of the most iconic buildings um, 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 built by humans. Gandhi, the, the freedom struggle fighter who left his imprint on Nelson Mandela in South Africa, and of course prior to that with MLK uh, in the civil rights movement. It's hot and humid. It's big fat weddings, right? If you ever get to attend an Indian wedding, please do, but don't think it's going to be like our Christian weddings. It'll go on for days, right? And people don't really pay attention to the bride and the groom. It's everything else is happening that's much more important. But it's a, it's a film production these days, big fat weddings. Chicken tikka masala, right? It's uh, Tony Blair, the British prime minister, said the national dish of England when he was a prime minister was chicken tikka masala, right? Uh, but uh, there's a big origin story as to where it came from. Yoga, of course, uh, comes from ancient texts, and it's become universalized. It's very colorful, right? You see even poorest Indians, there'll, there'll be a splash of color, right? It's, uh, it's just the sheer riot of colors is pretty phenomenal. Spices, tea, coffee, uh, you can have the list, right? Uh, call centers, which is one of the reasons it, uh, uh, you know, when, when the Y2K problem was happening, and American companies started to outsource all the calling. It usually went to cities in India, and, uh, and I would always have fun calling them because I could sense the person on the other end could call himself Jack, but I know that's not his name, and I'll say, tell me what's your Indian name, and then we'll have a side conversation, right? Because he has been asked to uh, Americanize his uh, speaking to us about solving problems. India has been in the news just recently, right? So I just did a quick Google search for the last year and a half. Why is it in the global news? Um, uh, for a somewhat of a poor country that we don't pay much attention to, it's also become a reasonably fourth largest, country, fourth richest country in the world now in the last two years. But it lands on the far side of the moon, right? So not many countries have claimed moon launches. Um, uh, the US, of course, is the pioneer, but uh, if you look at 200 odd countries, it's pretty phenomenal to have a country that is both in some ways trying to come out of poverty and make its people wealthy, but have, have nuclear weapons, but also have a space program that is, that is incredibly cost effective, right? So this is an interesting debate when I come to the US-India relations that you know, NASA is asking, how can we team up with you? Because they seem to produce it at one fifth or one tenth the cost just because things are much cheaper but it's also the technology that's used and so on. And the fact that they were able to successfully land on the dark side last August was, uh, was quite something. India is also making its voice felt. It's, it rankles many countries, and India being one of the foremost ones, that the UN system that was created in 1945 to create global order, that the Security Council is still made up of five members, uh, the US, China, Russia, England, and France, and yet you have Emerging powers like India or Brazil don't have a voice, and uh, and 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 of course, uh, what's happened in the last 20 odd years is this G20, which is a group of 20, uh, which is becoming another body of countries uh, that makes its presence felt in the U in in the world stage. India was the president of the G20 last year, uh, and I had the honor of going and giving a talk uh, in Delhi. So it is a big deal for them to host the 20 wealthiest countries to come to uh, New Delhi, the capital. Um, it overtook in China. So China and India together, uh, not a good thing to rail about, but together have about uh, close to half the world's population. Not quite, but getting there. But India overtook, overtook China this past year as the world's most populous country. So when you think about the Asian continent, uh, these two giants uh, have huge uh, both teeming masses of both opportunity and, um, and, and could be a uh, worry, right? Because you have the aging population that needs to be taken care of, but you also have a huge population that becomes your buyers, they become your workers, so they become a potent force for ideas and so on, and so it's how they harness the labor is gonna be the tricky question. According to Morning Consult, a New York-based business intelligence, their prime minister who's clocking in his third term, he just won the elections in the summer, um, and he is starting a third five-year term, Prime Minister Modi. 
was listed among the most popular global leaders. Gets a 76% approval rating, even though there are many critics of Modi who feel he has this authoritarian tinge to him. Uh, but then you see the shift to authoritarianism globally. So maybe relative to all of that, Modi comes across as being uh, one of the most popular, both globally and in his own country. Uh, Biden came in eighth, and the Czech president came in last at 16. Uh, that's Prime Minister Modi sitting in the front, and he manages to show his clout when he came for the UN. We just finished our latest United Nations uh, General Assembly in New York, where the entire city becomes a traffic gridlock. But this past year, he managed to get uh, all member countries, 180 of them, to participate in the largest yoga celebration as a way to both celebrate that yoga comes from this landmass. You guys have all taken it over and uh, customized it to your own, but I want to take ownership of the fact that as the Prime Minister of India, I'm going to invite all of you to the largest yoga demonstration in New York, which he did. And then um, I was telling Travis, the song from last year won the Oscar for the best music, right? So India makes it in sort of many lists, and this became the best uh, Oscar song. Um, uh, which I'll, I'll share the slides show with you if anybody is interested, and you can watch the YouTube uh, at your own leisure. But please don't try and the dance moves. Uh, I'm not responsible. Um, okay, so just to give you where we are in the region, right? Um, you guys are much more savvy about this, much more aware of this. I have to tell you that when I'm talking to your grandkids or 18 to 22 year olds who have stopped looking at maps. I need this because they have no idea where India. They've heard of it. They know it matters. But if I tell them, if I give them a blank world map with no countries, I wouldn't be sure where they're going to spot the countries, right? So I have to always tell them, this is what India is, and this is who the neighbors are, right? You need to know your neighborhood. So it's surrounded by Pakistan, Nepal, Myanmar, what used to be called Burma, Thailand, and then Sri Lanka is the teardrop. It's a peninsula, right? So it's bordered by Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, and of course, trade routes and the Silk Road that you all read about in these novels from history. You know, India was a, was a price trade route from the east, from Xi'an, China, all the way to Europe. And of course, uh, Roman traders uh, used to set out to trade for jewelry and spices and things like that. And that's what India has always been uh, at, the, at, the, at the crosshairs of these trade routes. And if you go east, if you go to places like Thailand, if you go to Cambodia, Siem Reap, and Angkor Wat, you will see 9th century Indian kings and traders who went east, settled down, married the locals, and spread Hinduism the other way. And of course, Buddhism, which originates in this landmass, also goes to Southeast Asia and then globally um, um, because of all the trade routes and the connections. So the Mughal Empire the empire that starts in about 1550s all the way to about the 1750s is the empire just before the British. This is the empire that gives you the Taj Mahal, iconic buildings. You see historic forts in New Delhi and Agra and all of this. But the reason I start with this point is in 1750, economists who study this, the Mughal Empire controlled 30% of the world's wealth. And the Qing dynasty in China controlled the remaining 20%. So together, these two empires control half the world's wealth. Right? Now, 1750 is an interesting date. Uh, Industrial Revolution is just starting in Europe. The US is 25 years away from becoming independent. And Western Europe is still coming out of feudalism and trying to discover capitalism. And these two control half the world's wealth. And this is what burns the Indians, the colonial period, because by 1947, India was the 10th poorest country in the world. Right? The colonial period, um, that's what it did. So it just give, gives you a sense of what hole India was coming out of in 1947 compared to what it was in 1750. Physical features, um, you have the Himalayas, of course, in the north. Um, Mount Everest is, is part of India and Nepal. Um, and the Himalayas, of course, are uh, in a wonderful mountain chain. And then, of course, you have the land of rivers. So in some sense, it's, it's very blessed, uh, much like the US, with lots of topography that is, uh, that is suitable for cultivation of crops. 
and you can see why it's been continually occupied from about uh, the Indus Valley civilization. Because rivers, there is fertile soil, there's mountains that prevent occupation from the top that then stop uh, invaders, and of course, uh, a long coastline so you can have maritime trade, you can have fishing, and so on. At the time of independence, India the landmass, right? So Winston Churchill, the prime minister, who was pretty critical of India, did not want India to become independent. It was a prize jewel of the British Empire. Um, it was pretty racist also, would say India is not in a country, it's just a concept like the equator, right? Uh, and there's a certain truth to that, because India as a landmass, we identify what I'll show you in the next slide is modern India, but India is a patchwork arrangement. Uh, the British came in and struck deals, much like, you know, there were 535 little kingdoms, and they were all coming together, and they all agreed to become part of India, and of course they had a choice, they could go and become part of Pakistan, because Pakistan, um, which is in the west, was also part of India. Uh, so were parts of Afghanistan, so were parts of Bangladesh. And so the deal that the British did, as they did in many parts of the world when they exited, they partitioned. And so princely states had a choice. The Muslim-dominated princely states could go with Pakistan, or they could stay with the landmass, what became India in 1947. But I think oftentimes we forget that India in 1947 was not, or rather through this 18th and 19th and 20th century, was not this unified landmass. They were warring factions royalties, monarchies, much like people who studied European history, where it's a constant shifting boundaries of uh, empires. In some ways, it's a much lower level, but that is what the partition um, and the uh, princely states, as they were called, uh, till 1947. So in fact, a remarkable act, which often doesn't get mentioned, is yes, people talk about Gandhi and Nehru, the first prime minister, uh, for bringing freedom to India, but I think equally, um, uh, mention should be made of the others who stitched the modern India concept, right, to negotiate with so many kings and uh, royalties to say either with, with bribes or with threats that either you'll be left alone or if you're going to be surrounded by this landmass called India to fuse this arrangement, much like our expansion, right, till we get to 50 states. In some ways in India, there's 500 odd little entities that had to be brought together and then you form the Republic of India in 1950 when the Constitution gets ratified. Um, now you see it's a patchwork arrangement of states. There are about 29 states. Uh, to give you perspective, India is one third the landmass of the US, three times the population. Right? So you can imagine the density of population, but it also gives you the perspective of we are a big country. Uh, but um, in some ways, uh, we are also blessed with lots of good things uh, in terms of resources and rivers and uh, land and uh, fertile soil and all that, much like India, but three times the size of India. But India has always had a lot of people, and now it's three times the U.S. population. These are the major cities up north is New Delhi. Uh, Delhi itself is the seventh incarnation of Delhi. So the oldest Delhi goes back to the Mahabharata. And people have discovered layers of Delhi as they've done excavations. Uh, or they're adjacent to what is called the modern city of Delhi, which was built in 1911 when the British moved their capital city from the, uh, from the, south, uh, the eastern state of Kolkata, which is where the British had first set up their capital. They actually wanted to build on a flat plain. They built uh, the city of New Delhi, which is now the seventh version of uh, what is called Delhi. But Delhi itself goes back six times. The Mughals had their capital also in Delhi, but they called it something else. And of course, the major cities, the way to think about it is Delhi's in the north, uh, Kolkata, or what used to be called Calcutta is in the east. Mumbai, which is the home of finance and uh, Bollywood, is in the west, or Bombay. And then south is where the British land, and it's home to major cities like Chennai, which used to be called Madras. You've heard of Madras shirts. Some of you wear Madras shirts. That that fabric and that weave came from Madras, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Bangalore, which is of course became a verb when Senator Kerry, then presidential candidate, uh, railed against jobs going to Bangalore and said, you will be Bangalored. He made that city into a verb when he said companies were uprooting themselves from the US and, and you know, Texas Instruments started there. Now, of course, there is such ties that those kinds of comments look slightly odd. But in, just in the 2004 election, Bangalore became uh, the Silicon Valley of India. 
and still is. Um, maps are interesting, and let's see whether we can get you through. Let's see, Travis. Uh, this is another way I thought just to motivate it in the remaining 15 minutes uh, before I get to some economic slides and the expanding role of the India is just okay, look at India in a different way, right? Um, you, in case you didn't think India is a little too crowded, these are all the countries where you'll find fewer humans than are currently living in the most populous state of India called Uttar Pradesh, which is that little orange state. Everything in purple can fit into that little oil or orange state. Right? So you begin to get a sense of how to administer and govern this landmass when you have so many people. Um, this rough map illustrates what the population of India is as high as the six next combined. Bangladesh, United States, Indonesia, Brazil, Nigeria, and Pakistan. How much area India would cover if its population density was the same as the United States? Remember I said it's three times uh, the population for one third the landmass. You flip it and said if you wanted to spread that 1.3 billion people on a landmass, India would go to have to go on an expansionist uh, binge. That's not going to happen, but that's what it looked like. Ten busiest airline routes. Not surprisingly, they're concentrated in Asia, and India is starting to make a mark there. In fact, this, some of these maps are a few years old, so when I looked at them recently, some of these have to be updated. Um, there's a tendency to think, think that India is a land of vegetarians because we worship cows. Uh, India is a home to lots of pescatarians, non-vegetarians, uh, and one of the interesting things, as the economy has become more affluent, non-vegetarianism has gone through the roof, right? Uh, as a status symbol, protein intake, all of that. And you begin to see the big red dots uh, that's happening. It is incredibly versatile in terms of its climate, right? People think it's hot and humid, not really. Um, you, this is just for comparison. Uh, there are parts of India that favor the Texas-Mexico Texas border, uh, parts of it that looks like the southern Appalachian, and there's parts of it that is northern Australia, there's interior West Africa. Um, um, you just see this incredible mix of agroclimatic zones, and so obviously what kind of crops do you grow, what kind of people, uh, what li livelihoods, and so on. And the thing that I always tell people who visit India for the first time, and if you've visited India, you'll know what I'm talking about. You know, when I, you travel in Europe, you begin to get a sense of diversity when you go from Mediterranean countries to the middle to Scandinavia. And if you think that diversity is maybe on a scale of one to 10, um, I would say a five or a six, India is about a 12. Uh, every, people have studied this. Every 40 miles, the language might change or the dialect might change. Uh, clothing might change, uh, um, uh, kind of government might change. So that incredible plethora of diversity is both a blessing, and it's, I can see the parallels to the US in uh, e pluribus unum, in out of diversity, out of many come one. So India has always struggled to try and imitate the US, where we have this incredible political diversity and so on, of how do you stitch the union uh, to keep it going uh, in the modern context, right? Um, and you see the climactic diversity. This is a big deal. Um, one, of the th uh, one of the things that India never, should have never been proud about is the fact that there's open defecation, right? The idea of having toilets inside your home was not considered something one needed to do. And so one good thing this current prime minister did was to say, you can have your space program, and you can have your nuclear program, and you can have your uh, aspirations to become one of the wealthiest countries in the world, but you've got to fix some basic problems like plumbing and sanitation, right? So one of the big things he did, he put a lot of his political capital in 2014 on starting what he called Clean India, Green India program, where he said, I'm just going to build Toilets. And so a lot of NGOs came in, a lot of international agencies came in, uh, students came, and they just started this mindset change that it's not unclean to have a toilet in your house, which is what happened as you go down the education spectrum. There are a lot of people thought uh, uh, that uh, you know having a, uh, what we would call a toilet inside a residence is not a, scene of, a sign of impurity. It's just 
what you need, not just modern convenience, but it's also for public health, sanitation. So that was a night and day change, uh, I would say, in the last 10 years. Um, as always, there is this pull to bring India together, and there are factions that keep wanting to break India apart uh, within, right? They feel like we are too, uh, each of our state units is too ungovernable. Um, I was telling your friend uh, from California, when we lived in California, the number of times a referendum will come to the legislature to break up California into six Californias, uh, saying that, Hollywood is not the same as Southern Cal. I mean, it's not the same as Silicon Valley. It's not the same as uh, the Central Valley. It's not the same, and they, we should break up California. California is the fifth largest economy in the world if it stood alone as a as its own country. And I was always fascinated that these referendums will come up, gather steam, gather signatures, and then when it came to a full vote, uh, it always got turned up. Right? People did not want to break up California. Right? So in some ways, this has had fits and spurts. We have now 29 states. When I was a student, um, we only had 22 states. So obviously, we are breaking up existing states for linguistic reasons, for religious reasons. We are carving up India into smaller and more fractious units. And at the same time, we are trying to send this message that India speaks as one voice because it's one country. Um, it's got an incredible railway network, right? I mean, that's one thing I do miss in this country, is not having a rail network, much as I love my cars and driving. Uh, and of course, India is now in the last 10 years have an incredible road network too. But for the longest time, it, people travel by trains. And then planes have become incredibly ubiquitous. And of course, huge highways have become the norm in the last 10 years. Um, tells you so many religions. Uh, India was a true melting pot before the idea of a melting pot uh, became famous. Right? It's also the home of many religions. Right? Buddhism started from here. Jainism started from here. Sikhism, the people who wear the turbans, started from here. And they still all coexist. And, uh, but of course, India is the land of Hindus. And you can see the purple is the largest uh, religion um, still in India by land, by land mass. All right, let's get out of this and go back to the last few slides. And then, um, so there was a lot of. Uh, Chest thumping last year when India bypassed UK, its colonial master, to become the fourth wealthiest country in the world. Right? So it's the US, China, Japan, India. Right? So from the 10th poorest in 1947, it's been moving up. And in the last 10, 20 years, it's really taking off. Uh, which, of course, uh, as somebody who studies these things, uh, if you don't create jobs and you don't control prices, uh, then in a modern economic context, you're going to collapse. And so for the sake of India as an economy, you want this uh, sustainability in terms of its economic uh, prov uh, prowess to show up. But it shows up. This is, these are all actually I decided not to take anything from American sources, I thought I'll go to the BBC and get their take. Uh, they were actually pretty honest in acknowledging that England has tumbled ever since Brexit. Uh, and they were pretty neutral in how they called it. I mean, these are data, and data can lie. But they were pretty honest in saying England needs to get, uh, the United Kingdom needs to get its act together if it wants to sort of be a, as a recognizable world power uh, because they've just ceded to the Indians. One of the interesting things, when you're a latecomer in technology, as we all know, sometimes you can leapfrog, right? So uh, you, people got tired waiting for a landline. Uh, and then they said, who needs a landline? We just will go straight to a mobile cell phone, right? So when India being virtue of a late starter to the industrialization game, it is now the world's largest digital payments, right? So many of you may use it. Many of you may not use it. But I think I'm pretty savvy, and yet I'm struck forever that I go to remote parts of India, and the guy doesn't want to take cash. He will point a little QR code, and he will say, you can just uh, digitally send me the money. And I'm sitting here saying, this, this guy who's selling me bananas on the road may not have passed fourth standard, but doesn't matter. He's connected digitally, and this is all in the last 10 years. 
and I'm the, my current book project is about digital India, and this graph tells you the rocketing speed from 2014. And what this has done is it has brought more and more women who used to depend on their husbands, oftentimes, the lower you go down the hierarchy of uh, class, the women have become entrepreneurs. The women can control their incomes because they have their own bank accounts. So what the government did in 2014, it gave everybody a bank account. Everybody, and then of course it, it marshaled the uh, sort of camps to talk to you. That don't worry about you, nobody stealing your money when you put it into a bank and you know, don't keep it in, you know, literally, I mean, this is 2014, but there's so much uh, worry that if I don't see my money, it's going to, you know, so to educate people. They did hundreds and hundreds of uh, what I call education camps run by the bureaucrats, run by civilians, run by NGOs, and that brought back trust, right? So a lot of people now have bank accounts, and which I should not be talking in 2024 in the US, but in India, it was a novelty to say you have a bank account, other than if you're in the upper middle income and so on. But now everyone does. Then there was a big push to have everybody connected uh, telephonically using the mobile network, right? So it is either the feature phone or a smartphone. Everyone is connected, right? Whether it's your painter, whether it's your plumber, whether it's something, it is far more connected. And in fact, it was a bit amusing um, we were coming back after I was away in India for a few years setting up a liberal arts university and then 2021 came back to Cornwall uh, and my son who is now a senior at Middlebury College he said dad we just left sort of a relatively rural part of India where I had 100 Mbps and Cornwall doesn't get more than seven. Uh, just to give you a sense if your speed is under five megabits per second, you can't stream Netflix. Uh, you need five and above. Now, thanks to Biden's infrastructure program, all of Vermont, you see maple broadband, you see everywhere. But this was, a, for me, a, a sort of a disconnect, right? The US was sort of the front of these technologies. And here I'm coming from India, which is still a relatively poor country, to Cornwall. And it's not like I'm un, unfamiliar with Vermont. I've been here since 1990. But suddenly having not dial-up, but having very uh, DSL under what was called GoNet Speed or whatever the company was. And I literally called them and said, what would it take to get to um, 100 Mbps just so that I'm used to having streaming? He said, well, an act of Congress, uh, and, uh, or else he said $80,000, because that's what it takes to run a fiber optic from the college. I said, okay, I'm not gonna do that. We survived for a whole year uh, on eight Mbps, uh, and occasionally my Zoom calls will drop because I'm in the middle of a lecture and suddenly, you know, connectivity drops. And now, thankfully, in the last two years, Cornwall is pretty well uh, mapped out thanks to uh, the infrastructure program. Cornwall is right south of Middlebury. Yeah, sorry about that. No, no, well, they all borrowed, hence New England, and you know, the old uh, six by six uh, Wentworth grants, so many of these little towns are six miles for six miles. So you, I always loved the fact that uh, when I first came to Middlebury in 1990, just driving up to Burlington, and you see little hamlets and little towns as you keep passing, the, sort of the baton keeps getting handed off till you get to the big hustling, bustling metropolis of Burlington, right? So you can see this incredible investment in health and roads and ports and uh, just things that India should have done maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, is now paying catch up. Right, so you can see the steady rise just in the last three years. Right, the government saying, in order for people to sort of be part of this modern economy and for India to be taken seriously at the global stage, we need to have, you know, the basic things like ports and electricity and running water and toilets and sanitation and and health systems. And so there's been this incredible. Uh, both in terms of public outlays of funding, but also private sector coming in and some very nicely documented public-private partnership projects, uh, which, which, because the government also doesn't have incredible resources because it's still uh, maintaining subsidies and trying to do a lot of handouts given it's somewhat of a socialist bent still, but the private sector has come in because they sense new markets 
uh, they sense uh, growth, they send new customers, and so it's just been transformational in terms of the numbers also. Um, one of the things as we are seeing the fourth industrial revolution play out, uh, so in some ways, you all feel somewhat glad that you're not fighting the rat race. This is my students are facing this challenge with AI, whether there will be jobs for them uh, or all machines will take over everything that we're doing. Uh, India produces about 12 million graduates a year, but right now it's only able to employ about 8 million of them. And so every year, 4 million students are just left wondering what's going to happen, right? And in a previous book that I did on developing a democracy, uh, we noticed that usually riots happen on the streets when three kinds of groups feels, dis feels alienated. Workers, that's the history from Karl Marx, um, farmers, and educated students who can't get jobs. India has all three of them in big numbers, right? So, uh, and this is not because the government is not doing something or the private sector is not hiring. It is just the nature of technology is changing in such a way that as we are still trying to get our hands around artificial intelligence, the jobs themselves are now changing. And you can see this on the left-hand side with labor force participation, it has been pretty flat, right? Uh, and this is sort of like, uh, and the female labor force participation has also been pretty flat. So many of them are being encouraged to be entrepreneurs or join the formal sector, away from the informal sector, but you're not seeing it in the numbers. And so at some point, this is like a powder keg waiting to explode, at, and, and that's a worry that the government has to think about. The flip side, however, and this might be my last graph, is that uh, just in the last 20 years, from 2004 onwards, you can see that uh, regardless of which big political alliance has been in power. Um, uh, the current regime has been in power since 2014. Its rival has been in power since 2004. But regardless of whether it's 2004 to 2024, 22 here, uh, manufacturing and exports have kept growing up, right? So the reason why made in India symbols, you see it in lots of things. It's not just in textiles. You see it in a lot of products also uh, because India has taken on a bigger and bigger role on the economic stage, not quite near where China is. It's uh, because China started reforming maybe 15 years before India. And China is also much more of a centralized authoritarian government, top down, unlike India, which has been a fractious democracy since 1947. And if there's one thing they're very proud of is that it's the only developing country in the entire world that has been a democracy from day one. They tried to flirt with authoritarianism for one year in 1975 when the prime minister suspended civil liberties and tried to jail journalists and put uh, opposition leaders. And she lost the next time she came up for election. She got booted out by the electorate. Right? So India prides itself that it's been a democracy. It's fractious. It's got opposition parties. It's got vibrant press. But it's not so it, in a way, it's not as uh, robust uh, as an authoritarian directed government like uh, Xi Jinping in China. But uh, Indians don't want to give that up. Uh, that's why every time the current prime minister tries to flex his muscles, the population tries to cut him down to size a little bit to say, we don't want to give up our democracy. But the question is, within a democratic regime, can you give us uh, the promised land? And that's what, the, in a way, the, uh, the pact right now is. Um, and this is my, I think this is, yeah, this is my last slides. Um, so BRICS was this acronym that was coined about 20 years ago for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So the big five countries uh, that are going to rival the US and Japan and traditional powers. And you can see the US is still way ahead of Germany, UK, and India is right now, this is in per capita terms. So the problem with India is when you divide that big number by 1.4 billion, it looks very tiny. If you look at the overall size of the pie, India, as I said in one of the previous graphs, is uh, the fourth wealthiest country in the world. Finally, I'll end on this. Why, why does the US care about India? Right? It doesn't matter whether it's going to be the Republican administration that's going to come into power or it's going to be the Democratic administration. Historically, Indians have generally favored the Democrats, but in the last two cycles, they have become ambivalent. They feel like 
uh, it doesn't matter who is in power because G.W. Bush put India on the map in a way that the previous Democrats never could. But even though they reflexively identify with the Democratic Party, but even in this country, you saw with Nikki Haley, you saw with Vivek Ramaswamy, no relation to me, um, uh, become uh, GOP candidates. And of course, you have the presidential candidate who is a Democrat, right? So India wants to have it both ways. Uh, they say we, are, we have become more evolved and we want to have a balance between the US and India because the simplest argument is the US is the oldest democracy in the world. India is the largest. And India is, other than being a democracy for the longest period, as I said, in the developing world, its other interesting claim to fame is that it's the only country in the history of civilization that has not actually attacked any other country. So reflexively, it's very pacifist. And so it feels that the US needs to pay more attention to us, don't pay attention to our rivals, China and Pakistan, which is, of course, America had to do it for different geopolitical reasons, why they favored Pakistan, India's arch enemy, why they favored China. But now, because of either Trump or Harris is not going to be looking at China very favorably, India is trying to use this moment very strategically and say, we are going to build on the goodwill of the diaspora in this country, people like me who are now American citizens and, 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 and love this country. And of course, many people like my son, my wife were born in this country um, who are of Indian origin, uh, but they are one of the wealthiest minorities in this country. They're also the CEOs of some of the biggest companies in this country creating jobs. They're also doctors and lawyers, and now, of course, they've breached the final frontier for the Indian diaspora, which is politics, right? So they say, this is the time to have high level, not just we love America, we love India for whatever social, political, cultural reasons, but actually strategic reasons. The defense and security, US is one of India's top suppliers from near zero dollars in 2008. It's now over $20 billion, right? And now a lot of people may not like that, but the US, of course, with this huge defense industry complex, loves India. And of course, has given India openings to make it a sort of partner in various uh, multilateral exercises, what's called the Quad, I2E2, which is India, Israel, United States, and UAE. That's I2E2 and other security forums. Bilateral trade increased tenfold between the US and India, just in the last maybe 10 days, 10 years. Uh, just sharing of technology and innovation, uh, investments in climate change and energy, education on people. India is the largest provider of students in this country. They just went past China for graduate schools and even undergraduate programs in the US. And of course, uh, there's, not, there's not as many going the other way. Healthcare, as I was talking to you, there's a lot of interest in tapping India's needs in healthcare and America's expertise in healthcare and trying to find partnerships in those areas. India and US uh, share lots of intelligence and counterterrorism, um, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in Afghanistan uh, since 9-11. Um, and I think finally, if I were to credit the American governments, uh, they realize that um, India is, has to be taken seriously as its face value as a legitimate country and not as a junior partner. And um, you got to strike the deal on India's terms, just like India has to respect the US is still superpower that it is. But now it's more of a talking among equals as opposed to even 10 years ago, where the US would sort of say, ah, maybe I don't have to take a visit from the Indian Prime Minister because they're not quite up there yet, right? And as I said, lastly, uh, there's lots of interesting conversations going on about space exploration, whether it's missions to Mars, whether it's, so the US-India relation watch out, it's going to be one of the most consequential relationships for both countries, right? For India, absolutely essential. But the US needs a friendly face in that rough neighborhood. And it really wants to counter China. And India provides that interesting countervail to China. So let me stop here, because I'm sure you have comments, questions. And I will be open to comments, suggestions, criticisms, anything. So thank you very much. I, one of your uh, charts showed that the uh, GDP per, per capita is pretty low in India uh, today and presumably was so in the past. But my question is, with the increase in, in wealth in India in general, how has that affected the average Indian 
and particularly the lower level of, uh, of the Indian population, have they really improved, or has it been yep. an improvement in a, in yeah. a different So story? it's a wonderful question, and this is something I spent, a, I spent a lot of my time both researching and talking. You know, the old Confucian um, saying, you know, don't, uh, don't feed a hungry man a fish, teach him how to fish. So if I were to be critical of development aid, 70s and 80s and 90s was that we thought we could just give you money as a way to bootstrap you. The big difference in the last 20 years is India has very concertedly spent efforts, and I see this in all my village level studies, looking at two second tier cities, is it's teaching people how to fish, right? So the, there's sort of the old Kennedys the rising tide is lifting all boats by all metrics. And the tide is rising, wealth is rising. But to be fair, the wealthy are getting wealthier at a much faster rate. So my rejoinder to President Kennedy, who I admire, who I never met, obviously. I was born the year after he died. Um, but my rejoinder to would have been to him, a rising tide does lift all boats. But my experience would be very different if I was in a luxury yacht or in a dinghy. Right? Both are rising up, but I'd rather be in the yacht. Right? Because so, so I think one has to be careful. Right? So opportunities are really, people are coming up. And it's being tracked that people's incomes have gone up. They're sending their kids to school. They are opening up companies. They're opening up little shops. And that digital infrastructure uh, that, uh, that I showed you about, the digital payments, they are just that wealth is actually percolating down to that bottom level in the last 10 years. So what can I say by way of metrics? The chief economist for the World Bank a few years back said, what in this particular graph, this one, what it has done to alleviate poverty in India would have taken 48 years if India had done it the old fashioned way. But by going straight to the root of who needs the money, and helping them learn how to fish. Paul Romer, the chief economist, said India has done it in 10 years. Right? Now, of course, we know this. Once you get on this escalator, your aspirations go up. Right? You, want, you want the next thing. So the, the challenge for the Indian government or the Indian state is how do you keep that going? Not in terms of handouts, but how do you improve the conditions for the average Indian to sort of bootstrap themselves? Right? And that is where I think the American story in the early 20th century in India, there's a lot of interesting parallels. Right? Um, we worry about the inequality in this country. I think we should. I think we should also worry about the inequality in India. But the way to do that, I think, is you have a more progressive taxation system. But it's not enough to just tax. You've got to invest it and build this up. Right? The previous regimes, you should just tax. But you just gave it as a handout it fritters away. So that is where I think the big transformation is as far as that's a, that is the question I would argue for any social scientist because no developing democratic country can survive in the modern day if a large percentage of its population doesn't feel like it's making ends meet. We see this in this current election in this country, right? And we are nowhere near the problems that India is facing. So in some ways, I think that has been the transformation which might explain why Prime Minister Modi has won his third election. Because for all his rhetoric for being slightly right of center and all of that, the average person feels that my life is getting better. And I'm not only dependent on government handouts. I need the government, but I'm, my worth is being recognized. Right? And that is really where uh, I think the transformational story is. Can you comment on the relationship between India and Russia? Hmm. So this has been a thorn in the flesh for the Americans. So the question was, what is the relationship between India and Russia? Right? So when, during the Cold War, India, remember when I started this talk by saying India has this very sense of civilization. India, before the G20 and all this, was head of something called the Non-Aligned Movement, NAM. Because it did not want to, in fact, John Foster Dulles, right, after whom our wonderful airport in DC is named, is supposed to have asked the Prime Minister, 
are you with us or are you against us? And Prime Minister Nehru said yes. Right, because he did not want, despite India being a very poor country, he did not want to pick sides. He felt that no country should pick a side, and of course that was not the American uh, story, right? I mean, we fought wars because we wanted to prevent the spread of communism. And so we said you have to be in our camp or you have to be in their camp. What is interesting about India, it did not want to become like Cuba or North Korea or Vietnam, North Vietnam and so on. It did not want to fall into the Soviet camp. It wanted to chart its own way because it felt that other than the British occupation, it had a lineage, it had a history. Uh, don't forget that. And so let us chart our own way. And there were 77 countries that India headed called the non-aligned movement. They were neither aligned with the capitalist world or the uh, Soviet world. But then why was there a tilt towards Russia? I think you can blame it on Nixon, Kissinger on this side, and Indira Gandhi, the prime minister on the India side. They just could not stand each other. And in some ways, the US decided it was going to back Pakistan. And there is this very visceral relation between India and Pakistan because they both were one landmass. And of course, after partition, Pakistan has fought three wars with India. Um, and so India could never understand why when we are a democracy and we have been a multi-plural, diverse country like you, why would you not support us? Why would you support Pakistan? Right? Of course, to be fair to the Americans, they needed to support Pakistan because their larger battle was to prevent the spread of communism. And, and then post 9-11, they had to support Pakistan because it's bordering Afghanistan. And we know that when Osama bin Laden got killed, it happened in Pakistan. Of course, that makes many people wonder if Pakistan was really your friend, why didn't they give up bin Laden much sooner? Right? So there's a lot of uh, hand wringing that has to happen in this country about our relationship with uh, the bedfellows we have. But I think that was at the root of why India felt it needed to go towards uh, uh, the Soviet Union because Soviet Union said, okay, we will try and seduce you to come into our camp. We will make your currency convertible so that you can actually use your rupee, which is not traded anywhere else. We, you can buy armaments, you can buy grain, you can buy oil from the Soviet Union because the Americans and the Middle East are not going to sell it to you, right? And so for the longest time, India had a very pro tilt towards the Soviet Union, even though ironically, it was supposed to be non-aligned. Now what's interesting is, it is now using its position of saying, we have long historic ties with Russia, and maybe we'll use our political capital to get Putin to not be the tyrant he is. But that is the current play right now because Modi says Putin will not entertain calls from the American or the West. At least he'll take calls and visits with us. And of course, the Americans would like Indians to be a little bit more forceful in saying, come on, get Putin to either give up his demands for other countries or, or just stop being a tyrant, right? So it's this fraught relationship that has its roots in the Cold War. Cold War is gone, but uh, the US-India relationship is very warm and very high, but there are still these thorny issues, and Russia plays this important role. China. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of economics, there's a lot of issues that you could, you could respond to. Um, but it, do you see the future in terms of China and India as a cooperative relationship, as a competitive relationship, or maybe both at the same time? So there are, there are attempts to define what is called Chindia, China and India, as cooperative. I think there is, I think there is it's sort of like both China and India feel that they have, they were one of the four original civilizations of the world, of humanity. And they gave us everything from literature to music to religion to medicine and so on and so forth. So they have this view of sort of this, uh, sort of a, not even a sibling rivalry. They're just a sort of a competitive sort of like, uh, I don't want you to get too far ahead of us. But the reality is China is so far ahead of India economically. 
the Indians consoled themselves by saying, we did not want to go down the Chinese route of being authoritarian. And so we are willing to be somewhat in fact, Lee Kuan Yew, the Prime Minister of Singapore, told the Prime Minister of India that democracy is costing you 2% growth every year. Right? And Indians said, thank you for your advice, but we are happy with where we are. Right? So that, and China started reforming in 1978 when Deng Xiaoping replaces Mao Zedong, and they basically said, enough of being socialist and communist and poor, we need to start embracing markets and capitalism. And India only starts this opening up phase in 91. So there's already a gap of 15 years. But then China has continued to march down because it's a bigger country, bigger landmass, bigger population size at that time, and more directed. Right? But this is why I use the uh, metaphor of the elephant and the dragon, because the elephant may not be as fast, but it'll have stamina. Um, and, and, and so the question is, people have written a lot about the 21st century being the Pacific century. Because the US is not going to sit quietly listening to that, even though we do have a Pacific coast. And, but remember, we pulled ourselves out of the Pacific agreement, the trade agreement, uh, when President Trump came to power in 2016. Now we are trying to create these arrangements, uh, like the Quad, which is a way to counter the belligerence of China. So India is seen as a neutral force for the US. And the real question is whether India is going to be useful for the Americans to take on China. Because I think what is now reality is that regardless of who comes to power in Washington, the US-China relation is on a bit of a uh, ice. It used to be that one, either the GOP or the Democrats, were more pro-China. I think both parties right now are how how tough are we going to be in China? That's really where it is, right? And I think China under Xi Jinping, they are taking the playbook from Putin. Xi Jinping just announced that he's a czar for life, right? That just happened two years ago or a year ago when he basically said, no more competition for my position. So either he dies or he gets killed. Um, so there is a lot more worry about China's aggression, whether it's towards Taiwan, whether it's to India, India and China fought a border war. Uh, India accuses China of taking over land on the northeastern border. Um, the whole issue of Tibet, right? So that whole property of Tibet, the Dalai Lama fled to India in 1959 and is the, is the spiritual head of, uh, of his people because the Chinese would not give up Tibet and India gave him, uh, gave him um, sanctuary. And China, uh, if you go to the northeast, uh, which I did two years ago, uh, I literally shook hands with my Chinese guards, right? There is a line. And they're very proud. That, and the guy told me through a translator, that belonged to you, right? We just took it. And, and now this is a big, so I think India is very nervous about China because China is just big. It's got a big military, it's got a big nuclear arsenal, it's got a big uh, navy. Uh, and as I said, India uh, historically has never gone attacking. And so it doesn't want to launch the first strike. But it needs the US to back it against China. Now, whether the US will, because nobody should take the China, Chinese lightly. So they are trying to find ways in which maybe China and India can cooperate, right? Hence, Chindia, right? Uh, they can make different things for their burgeoning population. So you see a lot of Chinese made goods, like you see in this country, you see them in India too. And now China is opening up the door for Indian products, right? So maybe this argument. You know, we used to hear in the European context that when 1957, the Treaty of Rome was signed, which became the basis for the European Union, part of it was to get the two warring nations of Germany and England to shake hands. Because Germany and England prior to that had fought three wars. The British, uh, Franco, I mean, British Prussian War, 1870-71, World War I, World War II. And people will say, because they have become friends, you don't bomb your friends. And since 1957, UK and Germany don't fight with each other. So maybe this is a recipe for more interdependence between potential enemies. So Chindia is a way to propose that India-China collaboration because you wouldn't bomb your neighbor if your industries depend on them for raw materials and so on and so forth. It's still in early stages. I think China's appetite for expansion is there. India's 
appetite is not for expansion, its appetite is for being recognized as a civilizational power. I think that's really what India is asking for. Um, it, it's been treated for a long time as this poor basket case of a country. It gave us good things like yoga and Gandhi and so on, but it really is not matter when it comes to the modern world. Now, when I put up things like the space program or defense, these are the what the modern world is looking at, or IT and things like that, then, then India may actually not care because they feel like they're getting the recognition. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you. Great questions.